It shouldn't have been so easy, but it was. Almost too easy, in fact. If she had known it would be so easy, she probably would have done it much sooner. She wondered why she'd waited so long to try it. Alex stretched languidly in her lover's bed. Turning onto her right side, she got up and walked to the bathroom, turned on the shower, adjusted the temperature, and climbed in. Quickly soaped herself up, being very careful around her slightly sore, newly fucked pussy, and was about to turn off the water when Trey entered the room, and she turned off the water while they switched places. Fifteen minutes later, the couple was ready to go. The man leaned toward her, but the woman pulled away slightly so his kiss wouldn't smear the lipstick on her newly painted lips. Easy, love. Let's stick to the plan, and then we can do this for a long time, she warned him. I'm sorry. You're right, he replied. It's just that your lips are so damn nice to kiss. The woman smiled radiantly. For the first month at least, this part of her life was going exactly as she'd planned. She hadn't expected anything less. In fact, she'd expected it to go on much longer. Some would call what Alex and Trey had been doing on Wednesday afternoon an affair. She, on the other hand, thought the term affair was too crude. Alex loves Trey and considers their Wednesday meetings to be more than just a smutty affair. Alexis Temple wasn't looking for love when she found it, for the second time. She had been happily married to Chris Temple for 12 years when she met Trey Latham at an executive board meeting at Parkfield Hospital four months earlier. Alexis is the director of human resources at Parkfield, and Trey is the new marketing representative for Riley Gordon, the hospital's public relations company. Trey was dressed in a charcoal gray pinstripe suit that was clearly tailored to his athletic body of 5 foot 3 and 102 pounds. His brown hair is wavy and thick, and his big brown eyes flash when he speaks. When he looks at her, she feels a tingling sensation between her legs. Over the next few months, they chatted a few times before Alex realized that her feelings for Trey were more than superficial. To call it an affair would be wrong. It's a relationship she has nothing to apologize for or feel guilty about. Saturday afternoon, Chris Temple went to the mailbox and picked up a handful of letters and miscellaneous correspondence that had been thrown in there today. In the handful were two envelopes from the state of Indiana, containing license plate stickers and printed registration papers for 2023. Chris opened the envelope addressed to him, affixed the new sticker to his license plate, and put the registration in the glove compartment of his car. He then opened the envelope addressed to his wife, placed a new sticker on her license plate, and attempted to put her registration down in the glove compartment. But the glove compartment was locked. Who the hell locks their glove compartment? Chris thought with anger as he walked back into the house. He grabbed his wife's car keys from the shelf, opened the glove compartment, and dropped the new registration in there. He closed the drawer and was about to leave when he had a funny thought. Chris opened the glove compartment again and looked inside. There, he found the car's owner's manual, the last three registrations, and a cell phone, the only one that surprised him at this point. Shit. Fuck, he muttered to himself. Chris knew his wife was upstairs in the shower. As had been her custom for the past six months, she had come home about 20 minutes early after her Saturday morning workout and, as usual, had gone straight into the shower. He leisurely turned on his phone and waited for it to fully load before looking at the call history. Since she didn't expect anyone to find her phone, she didn't bother clearing the call history. There was a short list of calls, but a long list of texts, all from one Trey Latham. Before he even looked through those texts, Chris realized that his 13-year marriage was over. Reading the messages didn't change his mind one bit. Chris turned his phone off, put it back in the glove compartment, and locked it again. Hanging his wife's keys back on the coat rack, he listened for a moment, hearing the shower still running upstairs. He went outside to mow the yard and think. Reports told Chris that his wife had been having an ongoing affair with Trey Latham for almost a year now. He remembered that her late Wednesday nights at the office had started around that time. Apparently, she would take a long lunch break and then add it to the end of the day to make time to work. About six months ago, judging from correspondence, they had added Saturday mornings to their game days. Chris remembered that it coincided with the start of his wife's classes at the local gym. Tears came to his eyes. 
He slammed both hands on the handle of the lawnmower. Hearing the sound of the mower from the second floor bedroom, Alex smiled. She knew that Chris liked to mow the yard, both for exercise and because he actually liked the look of a well-maintained yard. As she got dressed to enjoy the rest of Saturday, she realized that she was really lucky to have an adoring husband and a hot young lover. It had been almost a year since Alex had expanded her intimate life to include Trey, and everything was working out just as she had planned. Thanks to careful planning and good organization, her life had never been more fulfilling. A loving husband, two wonderful children, a great job, and a 29-year-old second husband filling in the emotional and physical gaps she thought she had in her marriage. Yes, there were times when she felt almost depressed, but for the most part, she knew she was living life to the fullest, taking a lover, a second love, in fact. She had completed what she wanted in life. She wasn't taking the easy way out, living her life to the fullest, it seemed to her. She was living her life to the fullest this day, and that meant being able to have sex with two different men on the same day, which was very lustful and always resulted in mind-blowing finishes when she managed to get her husband to make love to her in the evening after her lover had made love to her earlier in the day. After sex with Trey, Alex always showered and cleaned herself thoroughly, so she had no problem if Chris initiated sex with her on such evenings. In fact, after she made sure her husband couldn't find out that she had sex earlier in the day, she started initiating sex herself to get extra excitement from her own naughtiness. Alex and Trey's relationship was actually one of love, not just lust. The young man was warm and intelligent, and his interests were different from her husband's, which she felt made her life more fulfilling. Trey knew from the beginning that she was married and loved her husband, but she had more than enough love to include Trey in her heart as well. As far as sex goes, Trey is 13 years younger than her husband and more strong-willed, both personally and physically. He has abs and about 14 pounds of extra relief muscle on his body. Sex with each of them was also different. With Chris, they usually made slow, passionate love, and with Trey harder and more physically intense. Alex didn't get to have sex with the two men that Saturday, as Chris had slipped away that evening, excusing himself with fatigue. She had to admit that he looked a little out of sorts, walking into the house after mowing. In fact, Chris was pleased already that he didn't throw up when she tried to start something. As he lay facing Alex, he thought about how many times his wife had slipped him sloppy seconds. Chris was vice president of finance at a mid-sized tool and dye company. Every morning he arrived at work at 7 o'clock, tucked a capsule into his Keurig coffee maker, and rummaged through his email inbox. The plant officially started at 8 o'clock. At 8.15, he walked into the office of the production manager, Bob Casey, a friend who had divorced his wife of 15 years, five years ago. Do you have a few minutes for something personal, Bob? He asked, and when Bob nodded, Chris walked in and closed the door behind him. This can't be good, Bob decided. Five minutes later, Bob had already gotten the whole story from Chris and was on the phone with his divorce attorney, who was an old college friend of his. Bob's friend had hosted Chris at his off-schedule office that same day. Alex was shocked when she was handed her divorce papers the following Wednesday at the hospital when she returned from her date with Trey. She hadn't realized that her husband had been unhappy in their marriage. She completely missed the irony in how timely the papers were handed to her. While she was trying to piece things together, the thought of Chris finding out about her relationship with Trey hadn't even crossed her mind. Once she'd calmed down enough, Alex called her husband. Why? Why? She asked through her tears. What did I do wrong? Seriously? You're still asking? You've been having an affair for about a year now and you still can't figure out why I'm divorcing you. Alex was stunned for the second time in a few minutes. She continued to sob, but she had no words for Chris, so he ended the conversation. As Chris expected, Alex was waiting for him outside the house when he returned, rather than staying late at work as usual. Wouldn't Mr. McCoy resent you for not making up the hours for that long lunch? Chris asked, entering the house from the garage. I love you, honey. You know I do. I'm sorry I didn't tell you about Trey, but I felt like it was best for everyone, said Alex. For everyone? Chris interrupted. 
You and your lover aren't everyone. What about me? Aren't I part of everyone? Yes, you are, she said quietly. I guess I need to explain. You think so? Chris snorted. We, I, didn't tell you about Trey, because I knew you wouldn't understand, and you'd mess it up like you're doing now, she began. I'm messing up? I'm so fucking sorry. What exactly am I ruining? Chris roared. I wasn't looking for this relationship, Chris. It just happened, and I'm glad I did. Trey is a wonderful man. You'll like him once you get to know him better. This is so much more than an affair. It's so much more than sex, so much more than lust. I love him as much as I love you, Chris, and I couldn't give him up any more than I could give you up. But we're married. You can't love two men at the same time, Chris objected. Yes, I can. Being married doesn't mean you can automatically turn off your emotions, turn off love. You're my first love. He's my second. I am capable of loving more than one man at a time. It's not a question of one or the other, Alex said. Trey realizes that I have a full life as it is. He's willing to be satisfied with the little time I have for him. You and the family get the lion's share of my time, as it should be. I've taken nothing away from you and the kids. I just added something for me besides you and the kids. Trey is not your husband. He's an interventionist. He should be grateful for any time he gets from you. But I am your husband. And you have two kids. All that time should be given to us, Chris said. I love my life the way it is now, and I don't want to change anything. I need all of you, Alex said. I don't want a divorce. Yes, but I didn't want my wife to sleep with another man either. I guess we don't always get everything we want, Chris said. Remember when we got married, baby? Remember the words love, honor, and cherish? How can having fun with another man be loving, honoring, or sparing me? You make it sound so. Dirty. Disgusting, Alex said. There's nothing like that here. From your point of view, maybe. From my point of view, there definitely is, Chris said. Ah, she growled. The argument ended when the couple's two children came downstairs to greet their father. Both parents knew their children had heard the raucous conversation. The children, 13-year-old Josh and 10-year-old Kayla, looked very uncomfortable. I'm sorry you had to hear that, Chris said. We'll try to act more mature in the future, but yes, we're getting a divorce. We both still love you both, and you guys had nothing to do with our breakup. I agree with everything your father said, except that there will be no divorce, Alex said. He won't be selfish enough to ruin your lives because of something that happened to him. He won't ruin your life because he's not the one who cheated, Chris said. Mom, you cheated on Dad. How could you? Kayla wailed. Alex grudgingly wrinkled her nose. She looked first at her daughter, then at her husband. Watch your mouth, Kay. I'm still your mother, Alex snarked. Only because I can't divorce you shouted the girl back and ran upstairs to her room. Well, that was nice, Chris said to no one in particular. I think we should have a family meeting while we eat. Josh, go get your sister so we can talk. As Alex sat and looked at the other three members of her family, they had a frank discussion about her infidelity and impending divorce. He told the kids that he was filing for joint custody instead of letting Alex have custody of them. You can't take my kids away from me, Chris, she yelled. And I'm not going to, but you won't get primary custody either. You can't cheat and make me a father just for the weekend, he bellowed. So who's the guy you're cheating on dad with? Josh asked his mother. That's hardly appropriate, young man, Alex began. I think it's very appropriate, Chris interjected. The kids are old enough to hear the truth no matter what you want them to. Chris took a few minutes to tell the kids everything he had learned about Trey Latham over the past week. Alex was surprised at how much her husband knew about her lover. He was already in the habit of surprising her, and he wasn't shy about telling his children what he had learned. Alex spent most of this part of the conversation looking at her plate. There's no divorce, kids. I just need to get your father to look at things the right way, Alex said as she took the empty plate and glass and left for the kitchen. Both kids looked at Chris, who shrugged. They both knew their father well enough to realize that he was not the kind of man who would put up with a cheating wife. 
Finished with dinner, the kids headed straight to their rooms, but not before Josh said, We're here if you need us, Dad. We'll talk, but we don't want to be in the path of stray bullets, if you know what I mean. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it, Chris replied. After dinner, the family usually gathered in the common room to watch a movie or a few TV shows, unless the kids were busy doing homework. Alex was sitting in the living room, ostensibly reading a book, when Chris retired to the common room to watch a program called Jeopardy. He smiled to himself as he sat down at the table, knowing that Alex hadn't read a book in months. Sitting in the living room, Alex held back tears as she pondered and occasionally turned the page of the book to make it look like she was reading. Six hours ago, she had thought she had the perfect life. Now she realized that her marriage was hanging by a thread. And her perfect life would go down the drain if she couldn't make her husband understand what she wanted. What she needs. Chris framed her relationship with Trey as vulgar, almost base, when it's really not, according to Alex. Her husband is a good man, maybe even a wonderful man, but he's not without his faults. Weaknesses, if you will. Having Trey in her life filled those gaps, and their sex was a manifestation of their love, not a fulfillment of lust. Well, mostly, she had to admit. She'd kept her relationship with Trey a secret from Chris, because she knew her husband would never allow it. But now that he found out, the relationship seemed wrong. Alex thought she had thought of every detail to keep her relationship with Trey a secret envisioned every little detail, including the fact that their sex life remained pretty much the same as it had been before Trey came along, neither increasing nor decreasing the amount and intensity of their lovemaking. She racked her brain, trying to figure out how her know-nothing husband had suddenly figured this out. Until a few hours ago, Alex had considered herself the smarter spouse, also because she had managed to hide her relationship with Trey for almost a whole year. She had to admit that the first time Chris had enjoyed her body a few hours after Trey had not only turned her on more than ever, but made her feel her superiority. Trey seemed quite happy with the state of his relationship with Alex. Although she was 13 years older than him, she had the body of a much younger woman, a beautiful face, and was intelligent and outgoing. He was surprised at how quickly he had managed to get this seemingly happily married woman into bed. She made it clear that she was interested in more than just mattress gymnastics, though she wasn't looking to replace her husband. That more than suited Trey, who was enjoying the freedom of being a bachelor. The only request Trey made of her was to add a second day to their weekly dates. At first, Alex refused, but after a month, she enthusiastically agreed, and so began Alex's Saturday classes. Trey tried to pretend to sympathize with Alex's situation, as they met for lunch at a restaurant in a remote area where they sometimes met to eat. She had called the young man to make an appointment shortly after she arrived at her office. Honestly, Alex, if you get divorced, it will give us more time to socialize. It's not a bad thing for me, Trey said, taking a bite out of his sandwich. But I know you don't want a divorce. Do we really have to break up? I hope not. I hope I can get him to see things my way, Alex said. He's always been reasonable, and I know he still loves me, so if I can appeal to his sense of justice. If I had a choice, I wouldn't give up any part of you, Trey cut in. And why should your husband? Because he loves me, and I just need to make him realize that maintaining the status quo makes me happy. And doesn't affect our love for each other, she said. But until I can convince him, I think we need to calm down a bit. It'll only hurt the cause if I look like I'm rubbing his face in it. Chris wasn't surprised when Alex didn't show up for her practice on Saturday morning. He knew she was smart enough to back off, at least visually, from her relationship with Trey. Still, he just needed to poke the bear to gauge her reaction. At this point, you might as well go to your lover, babe. I've already filed for divorce, and I'm not going to change my mind. Chris said, as he and Alex sat in the common room while their children were outside. Just because you filed doesn't mean you can't change your mind, honey, she said. Do you love me, Chris? And the kids? More or less than me? She asked quickly. Alex caught him off guard. She could see the wheels turning in his head, trying to find the right answer. 
I love you all equally, but in different ways. You know that. What's your point? Chris asked. My point is that people can love many people on many different levels. Different and the same at the same time, she said. I love you and the kids and Trey, all the same and yet different at the same time. I can't give up loving any of you. I love you, Chris, and I need you. You are my husband, and as the father of my children, you can have me most of the time. But I also love Trey, in a different way and at the same time, just like you. But since he is not part of our family, he has to make do with a smaller portion of my time. Although he would like more, he has accepted that role. If you loved me as much as you always say you do, you would graciously accept your dominant role and be happy for yourself and for me. But you're stubbornly ignoring the obvious, Al, Chris pointed out. Trey isn't part of our family, so he can't be loved to the same degree as the kids and me. Nor should he be given a minority role in that family structure. Family is what we say it is, Alex said. I want to include it in ours. I'm a good wife and mother. Of course, you can give me that minority if you love me as much as you say you do. Of course I can't. I won't let you travel outside our family to have a lover, and for your information, I don't love you as much as I did two weeks ago. Unfortunately, you can't stop loving someone overnight, but your blatant disrespect for me over the last year has severely eroded my reserves of love, Chris said. I, uh, I haven't disrespected you. I love you as much as I always have, Alex said. Then you've never loved me as much as I love you, otherwise you wouldn't be able to have a lover, Chris said. He's more than a lover. He's like a second husband, she said. Yes, yes, a younger husband. I see, Chris muttered. Chris slept on the couch in the common room every night, despite his wife's constant entreaties to return to their bedroom. We can't talk unless we're in the same bedroom at night, she remarked. Alex's eyes got big when, at their first meeting with the lawyers, Chris's attorney brought up the sale of the house and the division of assets. You can't be serious. I don't want a divorce, Alex remarked. Well, well, it's going to happen, so get used to it. We need to sell the house so we can both afford something bigger than a closet, Chris said. All right, all right, you win, Alex practically screamed. I'll leave him, I promise. Like I can trust your promises. You had no problem breaking our vows. I don't see why I should trust your promises. You'll figure out a way for me not to catch you next time and cheat behind my back, Chris said. It's not about winning, you stupid woman. I'm the one who lost. Our kids lost. Alex lowered her head in shame. What if I let you have your own toy? Would we be even? She asked. You just don't understand, Al. I want, wanted, I guess. Just you and I. Beck Chris felt bad when his father-in-law and mother-in-law called a week later, wondering why he and their daughter were divorcing. He figured that since they were her parents, she should be the one to tell them. He had always gotten along great with Alex's parents, calling them mom and dad just like he did his own parents. I'm sorry, guys, he said sadly. I didn't call because I thought Alex would tell you. You know what they say when you assume? His father-in-law had aghast when Chris had told them both about their daughter cheating on him with Trey Latham. Are you sure, son? That doesn't sound like my girl, George Taylor said with a gasp. Well, it's not exactly cheating, George. She loves them both, and she doesn't want a divorce, said Velma Taylor. The two mouths opened wide in shock a mile apart. What the hell is going on here, Velma? George shouted. What do you know about this? He's a good guy, George. You'd like him. She's not cheating. She loves them both, Velma said. What the hell are you talking about, Velma? Explain it quickly and clearly or it'll be a second divorce, George said. Chris's mother-in-law apparently knew about Alex's cheating, but kept insisting that it wasn't cheating because her daughter loved both men. It's not cheating. It's polyamory, Velma said confidently. Well, if it's polyamory, then why don't I have anyone on the side? And why do I seem to be the only one who hasn't been told of these plans? Well, apparently me and dad, Chris said. She cheated on Chris and you didn't say anything? I ought to kick your ass, Vel, George said. I'm sorry, son. He's a good guy, George. You'll see that when you get to know him, Velma said. Meet him? I don't want to meet my daughter's boyfriend. He wouldn't have sex with a married woman if he was such a nice guy, 
George said. Thanks for understanding, Dad, Chris said. Trey held back his personal celebration at the end of his divorce from Alex, trying to look concerned, but really he wanted to jump and scream. After a year in which he'd sought to spend more time with his personal MILF, he was going to get his wish every other week, since Alex and Chris would be getting their kids a week each. Alex tried her best not to see Trey the first week Chris had the kids, but after crying for a week, she practically begged to spend a week with Trey the next time Chris was with the kids. That first Monday when Alex stayed overnight, Trey made dinner and dessert for the first time since they'd been together. Trey had ordered from his favorite Italian restaurant, and everything was ready when Alex walked in on him after work. Wow, candles and everything. That's very kind, Trey. A girl could get used to being treated like that, Alex said. Trey turned on Alex's favorite music, classical, on the stereo for the entire dinner. She smiled broadly at the young man, noting to herself that her now ex-husband only liked classic rock. She smiled even wider when, after the meal was over, he lifted her to her feet and spun her in a slow dance to a few songs. They cleaned themselves up and retired to Trey's bedroom, where they spent the rest of the night having sex. First gently, then more vigorous, Alex was sure that the evening gymnastics in the bedroom had been one of the best of her life. Maybe the divorce won't be so bad after all, she thought to herself. Trey was thrilled when he woke up in Alex's arms in the morning. He pressed himself tighter against the woman's round ass and began to rock gently. Twenty minutes and one position change later, they were lying face to face, breathing heavily from exertion. Oh shit, I'm going to be late if I don't hurry up, Alex said. Well, let's save time by showering together, Trey suggested, cocking his eyebrows. That sure wouldn't save time, Alex replied. You're going to stay here until I'm done. I promise to be quick. Friday night was their first time together in public at a restaurant. Alex was wearing a sexy, short red dress she had bought especially for the occasion. Damn woman, you're gorgeous, Trey pronounced. She knew she looked sexy, and she and Trey were an attractive couple. Several times during the evening, she saw men ogling her. Alex was physically tired when she left Trey's house late Sunday night to pick up the kids from Chris's house. She and Trey had had sex late Friday night, four times on Saturday and two more times on Sunday. Having a 29-year-old partner on a regular basis was physically much more difficult than Alex was used to. A month later, Alex dragged herself to the car again to pick up the kids. As had become customary, she was quite satisfied sexually. But on the way home, she felt something missing. It seemed that the more time she spent with Trey, the more their relationship grew sexually and deteriorated emotionally. She rubbed her right wrist, reminding herself of the scratch she'd gotten when Trey had handcuffed her to the headboard of the bed. A new experience for her. Admittedly, she felt somewhat devalued, realizing that Trey had forced her into submission. When Trey pulled out the handcuffs, she expressed reluctance, but he got over it quickly. She then lay down separately from the younger man, noting to herself that Chris had never made her feel anything other than an equal partner in bed. She mentally brushed it off, deciding that here was probably just a generational difference between her ex-husband and her lover. Even though the kids knew about Trey, in the weeks she had the kids, Alex only interacted with him a couple times a week, and always during work hours. She had yet to introduce her second love to the kids. On Wednesday, when Alex called, Trey didn't answer his cell phone or return her calls. When he didn't call Thursday at noon, she became concerned and called him on his work phone. The receptionist at Riley Gordon wasn't too eager to talk about where Trey was until Alex admitted that she is Trey's girlfriend and can't reach him. He's been in the hospital since Tuesday night, the girl on the other end of the phone said. Apparently, he got into some kind of fight outside his favorite sports bar and got hurt pretty badly. Perhaps that's why you couldn't reach him. The receptionist gave Alex the information she needed, and within minutes, she was on her way to the hospital. Fifteen minutes later, she was looking at Trey's battered face. Why didn't you call me? I found out two days later from your administrator, Alex said. Because of his injuries, Alex couldn't decipher the expression in Trey's eyes. He had a broken nose, two black eyes, and, she found out, two broken ribs and bruised testicles. 
Because your ex-husband did this to me, I know that, Trey muttered. That unscrupulous bastard didn't do it himself. He paid someone to do it. He'll pay for everything when the police get those two thugs. No, no, that can't happen, Trey. Chris is too good to do this. He's the kind of guy who would divorce me as soon as possible, but would never hurt anyone. I guess that's why I thought I could have two husbands, Alex said. Yeah, and how did that turn out? Trey growled. I'm telling you, he's a wuss, not the nice guy you think he is. He's going to end up in jail. I'm not going to be ceremonious with him just because he's the father of your children. I'm sure he didn't do it, but still, Trey, you should have called me. I shouldn't have found out two days after something happened. Considering how cold and calculating Chris had been when he'd filed for divorce, Alex couldn't be sure that her ex-husband hadn't had a hand in beating up Trey. And if he hadn't, she'd have to admit that she was partly responsible for the beating herself. What the hell, Chris? Does your ego feel better now? Shouted Alex to her ex when he answered the phone later that afternoon. Eh? What the fuck are you yelling for? Chris said quietly in response, perplexed as to what his ex-wife was babbling about. Nice try, Chris. Trey is very angry and hurting badly, and when the cops spot you, you're going to jail. I won't be able to calm him down, she said. Whatever you say, Chris replied and ended the conversation, still not understanding what Alex was yelling about. Alex had to admit that Chris actually looked puzzled by what she was saying. She wondered when he'd gotten so good at feigning innocence. How ironic. The police showed up at Chris's house about 20 minutes after he had talked to Alex on the phone. I made fresh coffee. I've been waiting for you guys since my ex-girlfriend called a few minutes ago. From what she said, I'm guessing that something happened to her beloved second husband. And I'm suspect number one, Chris said. Chris poured coffee for both officers and patiently answered questions for about 15 minutes. As they left, the officers agreed that it didn't seem as if the jilted ex-husband was a suitable suspect. A month later, police ruled Chris out as a suspect in Trey's beating. A few weeks after that, Chris and his father-in-law were sitting quietly at a bar on the edge of town, enjoying a couple shots of Angel's Envy Rye. Thanks, Dad. I owe you big time, Chris said quietly. The damn police were pretty sure I had something to do with beating up that stupid bastard. Yeah, you were such an obvious target that they just couldn't ignore you. But you don't owe me anything. I owe you for what my stupid daughter did to you. You've been a good husband and a great father to my grandchildren, George Taylor said. I'll tell you what, you'll have to buy the drinks from now on. I could get used to this expensive booze. They both clinked glasses and took a sip of the amber liquid. Two months after the attack on Trey, Alex hadn't had sex so much that she almost couldn't stand it. She had met another young man for whom she had developed feelings. And while it wasn't love, she wanted to, no, needed physical intimacy. From having two husbands providing intimacy just a few months ago to the fact that she hadn't had intimacy in two months, Alex was desperate. She thought about discussing the problem with Trey, but their relationship was no longer as close as it had been before the attack. And since he had been fine with being the second man in a polyamorous relationship when she was married to Chris, he should be fine with being the first man in such a relationship. For her own peace of mind, she decided that she would apologize later if necessary, but she would not be the first to seek permission. Delman Lafleur was almost as big as Trey, five foot nine, 98 pounds, and looked perhaps even a little better, though not quite as rough. He'd grown up in New Orleans and had a mix of Cajun and old-fashioned Southern accent. He's 25 years old, more polite but less brash than Trey. He works as a junior manager at a local firm, and ever since Alex met him in line at the nearest Starbucks a few months ago, she'd wondered if he could replace her ex-husband in the new polyamorous trio. Decided it was time to find out. By the time Trey had regained the physical ability to have sex, Delman was firmly in his former role as Alex's second husband. Alex met with her second boyfriend twice a week during the weeks when she had kids. Those were old enough to take care of themselves for the few hours she wasn't home on Wednesday nights and Saturday mornings as she had done when she was married. Just as importantly, Trey didn't need to know any more about Delman than Chris needed to know about Trey. At least not until he somehow found out about it, Alex pointed out. 
Chris and Alex's lives only intersected when the parents handed the children over to each other as part of their custody agreement and at some school events. Chris was cordial with Alex when they socialized, while Alex was constantly trying to gain favor with her ex-husband. It was the children who informed Chris that his ex-wife had returned to a polyamorous life, about six months after the fact. Josh and Kayla mentioned in passing that they often did early Saturday chores around the house while their mother was at the gym to spend the rest of the day with friends away from her. Hey, she is still your mother regardless of what she did to me. Be respectful and considerate, Chris said. It's not just about what she did to you, Dad. She destroyed our family, Josh stated emphatically. Chris had to admit that his son's assessment of the situation was correct. But what made him raise his eyebrows in thought was the information that his ex was once again telling the kids like going to the gym on Saturday mornings. Chris had never told the kids exactly when their mother had cheated on him, and being kids themselves, they had never asked about it. Chris put that information off until next week when the kids were at Alex's. He borrowed a friend's car and parked a block away from Alex's house with two Dunkin' Donuts and a cup of coffee. She was already all wet, remembering the morning with Delman and didn't realize she was being watched. Chris smiled as he watched Alex park the car on the street outside the house divided into two apartments. He wrote down the address while finishing his second Bavarian cream donut, and looked up just in time to see a large, bare-chested young man in only gym shorts greeting his ex at the door with a tender kiss on the lips. She definitely likes it big and young, Chris said aloud as he watched. Chris picked up his phone, pressed the button a few times and recognized the young man's name. A few more taps and he got a lot more information and chuckled happily. Thanks, Google, he said. Trey Latham didn't recognize the caller ID number that popped up on his phone. He thought about sending the call to voicemail, but then decided to answer it. Trey Latham, how can I help you? He answered confidently. You can't help me, asshole, but I can help you. Chris said without introducing himself. What the fuck do you want, asshole? Isn't it a little late to apologize to me? Growled Trey into the phone. I have no reason to apologize to you, Chris said. But for selfish reasons, I'll do you a favor you don't deserve. Do you know where your favorite girl is right now? I take it you do, Trey snapped. Isn't she with your damn kids? Well, she's with a kid, but not mine. She's definitely got her type. He's a big bastard, probably the same height as you, but a little younger. God, if she keeps this up, she'll be dating sperm in a few years, Chris grinned. Let's say I believe you. Who's the bastard? Trey asked. According to Google, he's Delman LaFleur, lives at 1234 William Street. The rest you'll have to find out on your own. I'm out of coffee, said Chris. Alex had barely entered Trey's house on Monday after work when Trey pounced on her, only this time not literally, but figuratively. What the hell, Alex? Trey yelled. How long has this been going on? I already told you I'd never share you. A little hypocritical of you, don't you think? Grinned back at the woman. It was fine for you to interfere in my marriage to my husband, but now that you've become my number one, you don't want anyone interfering in your marriage. We've been together for months. It started when you were incapacitated. I have feelings for him, just like you. If your husband, the one who was really married to you, left you because of this, what makes you think like I'm going to stay with you because of that kind of disrespect? Trey asked. You're certainly a great asshole, Alex, but no woman is worth that much shit. I should have no problem replacing you. But you love me. You said you did, the woman shrieked. Apparently not enough, he replied. Two weeks later, Trey was standing at the urinal in his office when his knees buckled in searing pain. Son of a bitch. Nothing says you're in love like an STD, growled Trey, zipping up his zipper. Staggering back to his office, he called the doctor and said he had an emergency. The doctor took pity on him and told him to report for treatment immediately. After giving him an injection and writing a prescription, the doctor's nurse came back with a notebook and pen and said she needed the names and phone numbers of all the sexual partners Trey had had in the last two months. He only gave the nurse one name, Alexis Temple. Do you happen to know if she's had anyone else besides you during that same time period? The nurse asked quietly. 
Trey blushed before answering. Yes, she has a second boyfriend, Delman Lafleur, and she may also be having an affair with her ex-husband, Chris. I don't know about that. I just have a feeling. Alex's stomach twisted when she got the call from the county medical center the next day. Shit, that idiot was sleeping with someone else, against the rules and obviously without a condom. Trey is going to be really pissed, she thought to herself. Alex was embarrassed when she had to give the nurse on the other end of the line the names of both of her lovers, as required by law. Are you sure there were no others? The nurse asked again, perhaps a little too smugly for Alex's taste. I'm not, Alex started, but then realized how it must seem to a nurse who was just doing her job. No, no one else was. The next day, Trey was on the phone with Chris Temple, ostensibly to return a favor Chris had done for him a few weeks earlier. Hey, buddy, just thought you should know, in case you need to get checked out by a doctor too, but I tested positive for gonorrhea. Alex is my only woman, so I know it's from her. You don't dip your wick in her from time to time, do you? Trey said. Absolutely not, Chris said with contempt in his voice. It doesn't surprise me, though. After eight years of bachelorhood, Chris was sure that he would never marry again. It suited him just fine, and he wasn't looking for a partner. After his usual Friday night workout at the local YMCA, he stopped at the vending machine for a Gatorade. The woman standing in front of him at the machine apparently didn't realize he was waiting because she stood there as if she had all day. Finally, he coughed, causing the woman to jump with surprise and turn toward him. Quickly looking her over from head to toe, Chris saw that she was Asian, with long black hair tied back in a ponytail. She was dressed in what he considered cute workout clothes, a tight burgundy top and matching yoga pants. He thought very few women looked good in yoga pants, but this woman was one of the few. Um, he muttered pathetically. The woman smiled brightly at him, her big brown eyes reflecting the smile on her lips. Wow, nice opening line, Slick. You obviously bought that bestseller, How to Woo Girls for Dummies, the woman snorted. Chris recoiled and raised both hands in surrender. The last thing he expected was verbal abuse from a 40-year-old soccer mom. Just kidding. I was kidding, she apologized, realizing that Chris wasn't really trying to pick her up. It always seems to happen here at this car. It was about this time that Chris's brain realized reality. He loved messing around with a pretty woman as much as any other man. Gotcha, he said. The dumb guy role always works with smart women. You girls just can't resist rubbing a guy's nose in it, he said. She smiled slyly. Yeah, okay, let's say I believe that, she laughed. I'm Jade and you're Chris Temple. And I'd really appreciate it if you'd make your choice because I really need Gatorade, he said with a wide smile. A year later, they were married in a small ceremony. Chris admired her sharp mind and quick tongue as much as her firm body. He learned that she was 51 years old, not 40 as he had originally assumed, and that she had divorced her cheating husband about 10 years ago. She shared Chris's views completely. I don't share my man, ever. Understand, Jade said as they exchanged their stories. And with you, I will never do the two loves thing. You are my one and only love, and that has to work both ways.